I'm Dr. Mike Murphy. I earned my PhD in computer science from Clemson University, and I teach computer science and information systems at Coastal Carolina University, located in Conway, South Carolina. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce basic security principles and begin discussing information system security. I'm going to begin by defining what we mean by security, discuss how security from the physical world evolved into the information world, talk about something called the CIA triad, which establishes the principles of information security that we typically use for evaluating systems, and then talk about some of the fundamental limitations and trade-offs between both security and functionality and between principles in the CIA triad. So what do we mean by security? This is something of a challenging question because we all have an intuitive concept of what it means to be secure, but it's sometimes difficult to formalize this concept into something that we can study and something that we can evaluate. For example, we feel secure locked inside our own houses or perhaps locked inside our own vehicles, but what exactly are we protecting ourselves against? What exactly makes us secure versus not secure? If we look back through history, we can see many examples of mankind's quest to build secure environments in which to live, in which to work, or to guard assets, to guard entries into areas, and so forth. In this photograph, for example, we can see out here the island fort, known as Fort Sumter, which guarded the entrance to Charleston Harbor in South Carolina and provided a secure barrier uh, equipped with cannons to attempt to def deter enemy ships from sailing into the harbor. Now, this photograph was taken from Fort, fort Moultrie, which sits at the sites of one of the earliest forts securing Charleston Harbor. And Fort Moultrie went through several renovations, including an early to mid 20th century renovation, where it was equipped with more modern weaponry, again to guard the harbor against unauthorized shipping that might enter or invasion from a foreign force. So a simple definition of security is protection, protection from harm. And this basic idea is as old as society itself, the idea of being protected from an attack, the idea that we can have some kind of resistance to theft, malicious injury, and other harms that might befall us. In the most basic form, we're discussing physical security, keeping out those who would do us harm. And for many thousands of years, physical security was the only concern that we really had. We didn't have information processing systems to worry about. So physical security really focuses on protection of assets or people from intruders or other types of malicious entities that might attempt to gain access. Now, we can also extend this definition a little bit to say protection from the elements, protection from natural forces, wind or rain or flooding. But for simplicity, we're going to focus for the moment on intruders. And the focus of physical security is typically about building walls, about excluding access to different resources or different areas by unauthorized parties. Here, for example, is a wall on Fort Moultrie, uh, Sullivan's Island, and this wall is designed for several purposes, one of which is that if someone is invading by land, it would be difficult to scale this wall. It would provide a means to slow down an invader and thereby uh, have, an have a chance to launch a counterattack. Now this wall also directly faces the ocean and can be used in a, as a bit of a seawall during storms and hurricanes, 
but the principle is the same. We're trying to keep out unauthorized parties, whether those be other people or water. So that makes sense. We have physical security, protecting ourselves from harm. What about information systems? What happens when we take a bunch of computer systems, a bunch of information processing systems, databases, different servers, business applications? What happens when we have these types of applications? We do have a physical security component in the sense that we don't want someone breaking in and stealing the physical server. But we also have some additional issues because the path to be able to get into a server is not purely a physical one. There's also an electronic information driven pathway, usually the internet or a system connected to a network, that would enable someone to have access to a server, for example. And in many cases, we want to provide access to these resources remotely to users. We want to restrict that access to legitimate users. So we need to extend our definition of protection from harm in order to apply to these different information systems. And we typically think about three main categories of harm that could befall an information system. The first of these is theft of information. A lot of information processing systems contain personal information, corporate secrets, and other types of data that we don't want unauthorized people having access to. If this information is stolen, for example, it could be used to launch identity theft or to have insights into a company's next product and possibly even steal a company's idea before they have a chance to develop that product. We're also concerned about alteration of information. This could be as simple as someone breaking in and defacing a website or it could be as complex as someone going in, altering database records to cover up fraud or other types of financial crimes. We also concern ourselves with denial of service, or DOS. This is when systems are attacked in such a way that they are busy responding to the attackers, and they in fact become so busy responding to the attackers that they can no longer provide service to their legitimate users. So secure systems must guard against these problems. They must ensure that confidential data remain confidential, that the data are not changed by unauthorized users or changed by authorized users acting in malicious ways with malicious intent, such as someone inside the company trying to steal information or trying to commit fraud. And the systems must remain operational, reachable, and functional or collectively we say available for legitimate users. So availability we're concerned about the system being up and running, being accessible, and functioning correctly for the users who are authorized to use that system. And These three principles form what's called the CIA triad in security and that stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In an information system we are especially concerned with these three things. We're in concerned with ensuring the confidentiality of the system or the data on that system, the integrity of the data and the system itself, as well as the availability of that system to legitimate users. We don't mind denying availability to illegitimate users, but we want to maintain availability for legitimate users. So confidentiality, let's start with the first principle in the CIA triad. This is the principle of protecting data from unauthorized access or disclosure. As I mentioned before, there are some types of data that are used in business, that are used in industry, that are used in government, that are sensitive. Social security numbers, for example, can be used to facilitate identity theft. Medical records are considered to be confidential in order to protect a person's privacy in terms of the types of illnesses they've had to deal with, the types of medical histories that they have. Uh, corporate secrets, so secrets about upcoming products, products under development, pricing models, things such as uh, even the margins or the amount of profit that a company makes on a particular product. We also have military intelligence. 
what kind of information has the military gathered, we might want to keep that information secret in order to protect operatives in the field, as well as to avoid embarrassment or tipping off an enemy that we might know some information about them. There are some attackers who focus on trying to steal sensitive information. Folks involved with identity theft, for example, whether it be persons committing identity theft or reselling information to other people who commit identity theft, are an issue. In addition, some folks will try to steal sensitive corporate information and sell that to other companies that are attempting to gain an advantage over the victim corporation. The second principle of the CIA triad, integrity, is the principle of ensuring that unauthorized or undetected changes to data or system configurations do not occur. There are types of attacks that attempt to alter records or falsify information, often in furtherance of other criminal activities, such as fraud. Other attacks, however, attempt to take over servers entirely. They might deface a content, such as websites, send unsolicited messages, so turn a server into a machine that's simply sending spam to everyone, or distribute illegal content, such as child pornography or copyrighted materials. Many other types of malicious uses can also be found for compromised systems. And the third principle of the CIA triad is that of availability. And this is the principle of ensuring that systems stay online and that data and services provided by those systems remain accessible to authorized users. Some attackers attempt to disable corporate, government, or other systems in a bid to try to disrupt the operations of that entity. This type of attack, known as a denial of service attack, is relatively common and occurs most often when servers are flooded with requests that prevent legitimate users from being served. Now we have these principles of the CIA triad, but it's important to understand that there are also some fundamental limitations that go along with our security principles. For example, one of the most fundamental, if not the most fundamental trade-off exists between security and functionality. And this trade-off works as follows. If I implement a system that's extremely secure, that has a very strict security policy, it may not be truly available to legitimate users. For example, I could define a corporate security policy that says certain types of business information simply cannot be stored electronically. They have to be stored in paper form. Or similarly, that certain types of information can be stored electronically but cannot be stored in a database that can be queried by people in the company. Well, if that information is central to the operation of the business, the inability of employees to readily, readily access that information could be detrimental to the business itself. The opposite extreme if I have a highly functional system that pays no attention to security, there's a high chance that that system will be compromised sooner or later, and that could potentially have serious ramifications to the company, both in terms of lost profits and in terms of liability and the potential of facing lawsuits, which could cripple a smaller company. Similarly, there are trade-offs between the principles in the CIA triad. If one designs a system and focuses on only one of the principles in the CIA triad, that system may not conform very well to the other principles in the CIA triad. For example, a great way to secure a database system in terms of confidentiality is to unplug that system and store it in a vault somewhere in a bank where it can be physically secured. It would be very difficult for someone to break in and steal information off that system. Unfortunately, however, it would also be impossible for authorized users to gain access to that system, and that system would have zero availability. The opposite extreme, one can easily configure a server to provide high availability by simply allowing that server to let anyone who wants to use it access it, and possibly change information on it. However, that high availability system 
will allow any information that's saved on it to be easily accessed by anyone, thereby compromising confidentiality. And if the configuration of that system allows people to change the information on it easily, that will compromise the integrity quite quickly. So there are limitations to security and fundamental trade-offs that have to be considered between the principles in the CIA triad. So to summarize, our main goal with security is to provide protection from harm. And in the context of information systems, we're really focused on the principles of the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Fundamental trade-offs exist between security and functionality, as well as between the principles of the CIA triad. There is no magic bullet to security, and there is no simple product that we can simply buy to make a system immediately secure. There are a number of trade-offs that have to be considered, and there are a number of things that have to be thought about in order to design a system that attempts to maximize the principles on the CIA triad, including the availability to authorized users. Thank you for watching. For additional lecture materials, please see my website at www.mikemurphycs.com. Please note that due to a high volume of email, I am unable to respond to questions that are not from Coastal Carolina University students. For more information about Coastal Carolina University, including admissions information, please visit www.coastal.edu. This video is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 Unported License. For more information, please visit the Creative Commons website. I'm Dr. Mike Murphy. I earned my PhD in Computer Science from Clemson University, and I teach Computer Science and Information Systems at Coastal Carolina University, located in Conway, South Carolina. In this lecture, I'm going to discuss threats, vulnerabilities, and controls, and how these things apply to computer security. I'm going to begin by defining each of these terms, threats, vulnerabilities, controls, along with a silly example of each, and then talk about some of the trade-offs involved in implementing controls. Recall from the Introduction to Security lecture, the CIA triad. This stands for Confidentiality, Integrity, and Availability. These are the three principles to which we want a system to adhere in order for that system to be secure. Threats are possible dangers that could compromise the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of a computer system or service. Threats could be malicious, in other words, they could be intentional threats, such as someone trying to hack into the system, or someone trying to damage the system, or they could be accidental threats, such as a power outage or a natural disaster. These threats may be external, in other words, this could be an attacker coming over the internet and trying to attack a server, or these could be internal threats, this could be an employee uh, in, involved in fraudulent activities such as money laundering or, or um, theft or embezzlement or some type of activity like that. So we could have external threats, we can have internal threats, and those threats could be malicious or those threats could simply be accidental. In identifying a threat, we want to ask ourselves how a system could be compromised. In other words, what are ways that the confidentiality, integrity, and or availability of the system could be reduced? What are forces that can come and potentially damage these things? Remember that not all the threats are necessarily malicious and not all the threats are necessarily external. It's possible to have an internal threat, and this could be a malicious internal threat such as a corrupt employee, or it could be an accidental internal threat, such as a problem with a circuit breaker in the building. There's all kinds of different types of threats that have to be considered. And not all of them are necessarily malicious. Not all of them are necessarily outside the company or outside the organization. So I've come up with a really silly example. 
and this is an incredibly silly example, but it allows us to illustrate some of the issues at hand uh, without having to worry about technical details. So in this silly example, I have a small object, specifically a pen, and my cat has this tendency of taking small objects like pens and kicking them off tables and turning them into toys and sometimes kicking them under the refrigerator or under the stove. And when he does this, of course, with a small object, uh, I have to go and find the object in order to restore its availability to me. It's also possible for the cat to chew on, on objects like pens and so forth. He doesn't really do that so much. Uh, he does like to chew on paper, though. So we have a pen. The cat can threaten the pen. And the outcome of that threat could be denying the availability of the pen because it's been kicked up under the refrigerator. So here we have the cat threatening the pen. Uh, actually, I think he was more interested in napping at this, at this point. But uh, we have a cat. We have a pen. There's our potential threat. Now, the difference between a threat and a vulnerability is that vulnerabilities are weaknesses in a system that permit a threat to be realized, compromising the confidentiality, integrity, and or availability of the system. So the threat is the potential harm that could come to the system or the potential force that could affect the system. The vulnerability is the weakness in the system that allows that threat to get in and materialize. A critical vulnerability is a flaw that can be exploited by an attacker with the correct tools or by the correct situation. In other words, this is a vulnerability that we know exists in the system, we know there are tools to exploit the vulnerability, and we know that all it takes is someone accessing that particular vulnerability with those particular tools to launch a successful attack. So when we look to identify vulnerabilities, now, we've identified threats. What we need to do is we need to decide how those threats can potentially affect the system. In other words, what weaknesses are present in the system that enable that threat to materialize into some kind of dysfunction, into some kind of theft of information, into some kind of damage to the system, or into some kind of denial of service situation, some type of availability removal or reduction. It's a subtle difference between vulnerabilities and threats. Okay, threats give us sort of big picture things that could come in and potentially damage the system. The vulnerability is an avenue that those threats can take in order to actually damage the system. So it's a subtle difference. They are related. But basically, a, a vulnerability allows a threat to materialize. So in our silly example, perhaps this will make it a little bit clearer. Why is the cat able to threaten the pen? Okay, we have the cat who wants to grab the pen, take it, kick it under the refrigerator. That's the threat. What makes the pen vulnerable to that threat? Well, it's actually the pen's characteristics. It's a small object. It is a small and light object. And the cat is much bigger than the pen. The cat has the strength to move the pen. The pen is about the right size and shape to be batted around with a paw. And so the light weight of the pen allows the cat to manipulate it easily. If the cat is able to reach the pen, grab the pen, kick it off a table, and start batting it around the floor, then that becomes a critical vulnerability because the pen is just sitting there, it's readily accessible, the cat can take it and turn it into a toy. So. You can see here we have the pen, and the pen is not very large, not very heavy uh, compared to the cat, and so it's actually the small size of this object relative to the cat that enables the cat to threaten it. Okay, so if we have these threats, and we have vulnerabilities to potential threats, what measures can we take, what steps can we take to try to mitigate those threats, to try to close those vulnerabilities? And the answer is we have what are called controls, or security controls. And these are safeguards that are implemented to close vulnerabilities and mitigate threats in order to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the system. 
So controls can be physical, they can be procedural, they can be technical. A very simple control that you're probably using on a regular basis is simply locking a door. Locking the door to your house or your apartment, locking the door to your car. That's a very simple physical control. It denies access to someone simply opening the door and using very little effort to gain access. We can also have procedural controls. For example, for example, when handling money, it is possible to have a procedure that says that two employees have to be present. This way, one employee has a harder time simply skimming some money out of the drawer, skimming some money out of the safe. In the security of information field, or in computer security, these controls can be technical. We can have system policies in place that prevent certain actions. We can require data to be encrypted. So we have these different controls that we can implement in order to try to protect the system. In order to identify controls, we need to ask ourselves what kind of vulnerabilities there are to the types of threats that we've determined exist, and how can those vulnerabilities be closed or how can we mitigate the threats? What safeguards can we put in place to make the system less vulnerable to a specific threat? What types of protective measures can we take? So let's take our silly example again. There are a couple of ways that we could make the pen less vulnerable to the cat. One way is that we could increase the size or weight of the pen so that the cat couldn't move it. So we could make the pen four feet long and weigh 20 pounds, and then the cat is not going to be able to move the pen. That would be a way of directly closing the vulnerability. Uh, unfortunately, that choice would have some side effects. It would be fairly difficult to write with a 20 pound, four foot long pen. We could secure the pen where the cat couldn't reach it. So we could close the vulnerability by preventing its exploitation. This is a fairly simple approach and it's one I'll talk about a little bit more in, in, a, mo in a moment and it has certain benefits as long as it's implemented correctly. Another solution would be to